Horseshoes by Ring Lardner. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The series ended Tuesday, but I stayed in Philadelphia an extra day on the chance of there being some follow up stuff worth sending. Nothing had broken loose. So I filed some stuff about what the athletics and giants were going to do with their dough, and then caught the eight o'clock train for Chicago. Having passed up supper in order to get my story away and grab the train, I went to the buffet car right after I'd planted my grips. I sat down at one of the tables and ordered a sandwich. Four salesmen were playing rum at the other table, and all the chairs in the car were occupied, so it didn't surprise me when somebody flopped down in the seat opposite me. I looked up for my paper, and with a little thrill recognized my companion. Now, I've been experting round the country with ball players so much that it doesn't usually excite me to meet one face to face, even if he's a star. I can talk with Tyrus without getting all fussed up, but this particular player had jumped from obscurity to fame so suddenly and had played such an important, though brief, part in the recent argument between the Max and McGraws that I couldn't help being a little awed by his proximity. It was none other than Grimes, the utility outfielder, Connie had been forced to use in the last game because of the injury to Joyce. Grimes! whose miraculous catch in the eleventh inning had robbed Parker of a home run and the Giants of victory, and whose own homer, a fluky one, had given the Athletics another world's championship. I had met Grimes one day during the spring he was with the Cubs, but I knew he wouldn't remember me. A ball player never recalls a reporter's face on less than six introductions, or his name on less than twenty. However, I resolved to speak to him, and had just mustered sufficient courage to open a conversation when he saved me the trouble. "'Whose picture have they got there?' he asked, pointing to my paper. "'Speed Parker's,' I replied. "'What do they say about him?' asked Grimes. "'I'll read it to you,' I said. "'Speed Parker, McGraw's great third baseman, is ill in a local hospital with nervous prostration.' the result of the strain of the World Series, in which he played such a stellar role. Parker is in such a dangerous condition that no one is allowed to see him. Members of the New York team and fans from Gotham called at the hospital today, but were unable to gain admittance to his ward. Philadelphians hope he will recover speedily and will suffer no permanent ill effects from his sickness for he won their admiration by his work in the series, though he was on a rival team. A lucky catch by Grimes, the athletic substitute outfielder, was all that prevented Parker from winning the title for New York. According to manager Mack of the champions, the series would have been over in four games but for Parker's wonderful exhibition of nerve and... and that'll be plenty, Grimes interrupted. And that's just what you might expect from one of them dough-headed reporters. If all the baseball writers was where they belonged, they'd have to build an annex to Matawan. I kept my temper with very little effort. It takes more than a peevish ball player's remarks to insult one of our fraternity, but I didn't exactly understand his peeve. Doesn't Parker deserve the bouquet? I asked. Oh, they can boost them all they want to, said Grimes. But when they call that catch lucky, and don't mention the fact that Parker is the luckiest guy in the world, something must be wrong with him. Did you see the series? No, I lied glibly, hoping to draw from him the cause of his grouch. Well, he said, you sure missed something. They never was a series like it before, and they won't never be one again. It went the full seven games, and every game was a bear. They was one big inning every day, and Parker was the big cheese in it. Just as Connie says, 
The athletics would have cleaned them in four games, but for Parker. But it wasn't because he's a great ball player. It was because he was born with a knife, fork, and spoon in his mouth, and a rabbit's foot hung round his neck. You may not know it, but I'm Grimes, the guy that made the lucky catch. I'm the guy that won the series with a hit, a home run hit. And I'm here to tell you that if I'd had one-tenth of Parker's luck, they'd have heard about me long before yesterday. They say my homer was lucky. Maybe it was, but believe me, it was time things broke for me. They'd been breaking for him all of his life. Well, I said, his luck must have gone back on him if he's in a hospital with nervous prostration. Nervous prostration, nothing, said Grimes. He's in a hospital because his face is all out of shape and he's ashamed to appear on the street. I don't usually do so much talking, and I'm raving a little tonight because I've had a couple of drinks, but... Have another, said I, ringing for the waiter, and talk some more. I made two hits yesterday, Grimes went on, but the crowd only seen one. I busted up the game in a serious with the one they seen. The one they didn't see was the one I busted up a guy's map with, and Speed Parker was the guy. That's why he's in a hospital. He may be able to play ball next year, but I'll bet my share of the dough that McGraw won't recognize him when he shows up at Marlin in the spring. When did this come off, I asked, and why? It come off outside the clubhouse after yesterday's battle, he said. I hit him because he called me a name, a name I won't stand for, from him. What did he call you, I queried expecting to hear one of the delicate epithets usually applied by conquered to conqueror on the diamond. Horseshoes, was Grimes' amazing reply. But, good Lord, I remonstrated. I've heard of ball players calling each other that, and Lucky Stiff and Four-Leaf Clover ever since I was a foot high, and I never knew them to start fights about it. Well, said Grimes, I might as well give you all the dope. And then if you don't think I was justified, I'll pay for your fare from here to wherever you're going. I don't want you to think I'm kicking about trifles, or that I'm kicking at all for that matter. I just want to prove to you that he didn't have no license to pull that horseshoe stuff on me, and that I only give him what he was coming to him. Go ahead and shoot, said I. Give us some more of the same, said Grimes to the passing waiter, and then he told me about it. Maybe you've heard that me and Speed Parker was raised in the same town, Ishpeming, Michigan. When we was about twelve years old, Speed throwed a rotten egg at the teacher, and I got expelled. That made me sick of schools, and I wouldn't ever go to one again, though my old man beat me up and the truant officers threatened to have me hung. Well, while Speed was learning about what was the principal products of New Hampshire and Texas, I was working round the freight house and driving a dray. We'd both been playing ball all our lives, and when the town organized a semi-pro club, we got jobs with it. We was to draw two bucks apiece for each game, and they played every Sunday. We played four games before we got our first pay. There was a hole in my pants pocket as big as the home plate, but I forgot about it and put the dough in there. It wasn't there when I got home. Speed didn't have no hole in his pocket, you can bet on that. Afterward, the club hired a good outfielder and I was canned. They was hunting for another third baseman too, but of course they didn't find none and Speed held his job. The next year, they started the Northern Peninsula League. We landed with the home team. The league opened in May and blowed up the third week in June. They paid off all the outsiders first and then had just money enough left to settle with one of us two Ishpeman guys. The night they'd done the paying, I was out to my uncle's farm, so they settled with speed and told me I'd have to wait for mine. I'm still waiting. Gene Higgins, 
who was manager of the Battle Creek Club, lived in Houghton, and that winter we goes over and strikes him for a job. He give it to us, and we busted in together two years ago last spring. I had a good year down there. I hit over 300 and stole all the bases in sight. Speed got along good, too, and they were several big league scouts looking us over. The Chicago Cubs bought Speed outright, and four clubs put in a draft for me. Three of them, Cleveland and the New York Giants and the Boston Nationals, needed outfielders bad, and it would have been a pipe for me to have made good with any of them. But who do you think got me? The same Chicago Cubs. And the only outfielders they had at that time was Schulte and Leach and Good and Williams and Stewart and one or two others. Well, I didn't figure I was any worse off than speed. The Cubs had Zimmerman at third base, and it didn't look like they was any danger of a busher beating him out. But Zimmerman goes and breaks his leg the second day of the season. That's a year ago, last April, and speed jumps right in as a regular. Do you think anything like that could happen to Schulte or Leach or any of them outfielders? No, sir. I wore out my uniform sliding up and down the bench and wondering whether they'd ship me to Fort Worth or Siberia. Now I want to tell you about the miserable luck Speed had right off the reel. We was playing at St. Louis. They had a one-run lead in the eighth when their pitcher walked Speed with one out. Sire hits a high fly to center, and Parker starts with a crack of the bat. Both coaches was yelling at him to go back, but he thought they was two out, and he was clear round to third base when the ball come down. And Oaks muffs it. Of course he scored, and the game was tied up. Parker come into the bench like he did something wonderful. Did you think they was two out? asked Hank. No, says Speed, blushing. Then what did you run for, says Hank. I had a hunch he was going to drop the ball, says Speed, and Hank pretty near falls off the bench. The next day he come up with one out and the sacks full, and the score tied in the sixth. He smashes one on the ground straight at Hauser, and it looked like a cinch double play, But just as Hauser was going to grab it, the ball hit a rough spot and hopped a mile over his head. It got between Oaks and McGee and went clear to the fence. Three guys scored, and Speed pulled up at third. The papers come out and said the game was won by a three-bagger from the bat of Parker, the Cubs' sensational kid third baseman. Gosh! We go home to Shy and are having a hot battle with Pittsburgh. This time, Speed's turn come when they was two on and two out, and Pittsburgh a run to the good. I think it was the eighth inning. Cooper gives him a fast one, and he hits it straight up in the air. Of course, the runners started going, but it looked hopeless because there wasn't no wind or high sky to bother anybody. Mowry and Gibson both goes after the ball, and just as Mowry was set for the catch, Gibson bumps into him, and they both fall down. Two runs scored, and Speed got the second. Then what does he do but try to steal third, with two out, too? And Gibson's peg pretty near hits the left field seats on the fly. When Speed comes to the bench, Hank says, If I was you, I'd quit playing ball and go to Monte Carlo. What for? says Speed. You're so damn lucky, says Hank. So is Ty Cobb, says Speed. That's how he hated himself. First trip to Cincy, we run into a couple of old Ishpeming boys. They took us out one night, and about 12 o'clock, I said we'd have to go back to the hotel or we'd get fined. Speed said I had cold feet, and he stuck with the boys. I went back home, and Hank caught me coming in and put a $50 plaster on me. Speed stayed out all night long, and Hank never knowed it. I says to myself, wait till he gets out there and tries to play ball without no sleep. But the game that day was called off on account of ring. Can you beat it? I remember what he got away with the next afternoon, the same as though it happened yesterday. 
In the second inning, they walked him with nobody down, and he took a big lead off first base like he always does. Benton throwed over there three or four times to scare him back, and the last time he throwed, Hobby hid the ball. The coacher seen it and told Speed to hold the bag, but he didn't pay no attention. He started leading right off again, and Hobby tried to tag him, but the ball slipped out of his hand and rolled about a yard away. Parker had plenty of time to get back, but instead of that, he starts for second. Hobby picked up the ball and shot it down to Grow, and Grow made a square muff. Parker slides into the bag safe, and then gets up and throws out his chest like he'd made the greatest play ever. When the ball strode back to Benton, Speed leads off about 30 foot and stands there in a trance. Clark signs for a pitch out and pegs the ball down to second to nip him. He was caught flat-footed. That is, he would have been with a decent throw, but Clark's peg went pretty near to Latonia. Speed scored and strutted over to receive our hearty congratulations. Some of the boys was laughing, and he thought they was laughing with him instead of at him. It was in the ninth, though, that he got by with one of the worst I ever seen. The Reds was a run behind, and Marsons was on third base with two out. Hobby, I think it was, hit one on the ground right at speed, and he picked it up clean. The crowd all got up and started for the exits. Marsons ran toward the plate in the faint hope that the peg to first would be wild. All of a sudden, the boys on the Cincy bench began yelling at him to slide, and he done so. He was way past the plate when Speed's throw got to Archer. The bonehead had shot the ball home instead of to first base, thinking they was only one down. We was all crazy believing his nut play had let him tie it up, but he comes tearing in, telling Archer to tag Marsons. So, Jim walks over and tags the Cuban, who is brushing off his uniform. You're out, says Clem. You never touch the plate. I guess Marsons knowed the umps was right, because he didn't make much of a holler. But Speed sure got a panning in the clubhouse. I suppose you knowed he was going to miss the plate, said Hank, sarcastic as he could. Everybody on the club roasted him, but it didn't do no good. Well, you know what happened to me. I only got into one game with the Cubs, one afternoon when Leach was sick. We was playing the Boston Bunch, and Tyler was working against me. I always had trouble with left-handers, and this was one of his good days. I couldn't see what he throwed up there. I got one foul during the afternoon's entertainment, and the wind was blowing a hundred-mile gale so that the best outfielder in the world couldn't judge a fly ball. That Boston bunch must have hit 50 of them, and they all come to my field. If I caught any, I forgot about it. A couple of days after that, I got notice of my release to Indianapolis. Barker kept right on all season doing the blamedest things you ever heard of and getting away with it. One of the boys told me about it later. If they was playing a doubleheader in St. Louis with a thermometer at 130 degrees, he'd get put out by the umps in the first inning of the first game. If he started to steal, the catcher dropped a pitch, or somebody'd muff the throw. If he hit a pop fly, the sun get in somebody's eyes. If he took a swell third strike with the bases full, the umps would call it a ball. If he cut first base by 20 feet, the umps would be reading the morning paper. Zimmerman's leg mended, so that he was all right by June. And then Sire got sick, and they tried speed at first base. He'd never saw the bag before, but things kept on breaking out for him, and he played it like a house of fire. The Cubs copped the pennant and Speed got in on the big dough, besides playing a whale of a game through the whole series. Speed and me both went back to Ishpeming to spend the winter, though the Lord knows it ain't no winter resort. Our homes was there, plus in my case there was a certain girl living in the old burg. Parker, of course, was the hero, and the swell guy when we got home. I come home with nothing but my suitcase, and a hard luck story, which I kept to myself. 
I hadn't even went good enough in Indianapolis to be sure of a job there again. That fall, last fall, an Uncle Speeds died over in the Sioux and left him ten thousand bucks. I had an uncle down in the Lower Peninsula who was worth five times that much, but he had good health. This girl I spoke about was the prettiest thing I ever see. I'd went with her in the old days, and when I blew back, I found she was still strong for me. There wasn't a great deal of variety in Ishpeming for a girl to pick from. Her and I went to the dance every Saturday night and to church Sunday nights. I called her on Wednesday evenings, besides taking her to all the shows that come along, rotten as most of them was. I'd never knowed Speed was making a play for this doll till a long last February. The minute I seen what was up, I got busy. I took her out sleigh riding and kept her out in the cold till she'd promised to marry me. We set the date for this fall. I figured I'd know better where I was at by that time. Well, we didn't make no secret of being engaged. Down in the pool room one night, Speed come up and congratulated me. He says, You got a swell girl, Dick. I wouldn't mind being in your place. You're mighty lucky to cop her out. Oh, you old horseshoes, you. Horseshoes, I says. You got a fine license to call anybody horseshoes. I suppose you ain't never had no luck. Not like you, he says. I was feeling too good about grabbing a girl to get sore at the time. But when I got to thinking about it a few minutes afterward, it made me mad clear through. What right did that bird have to talk about me being lucky? Speed was playing freeze out at a table near the door, and when I started home, some of the boys with him says, Good night, Dick. I said good night, and then Speed looked up. Good night, horseshoes, he says. That got my nanny this time. Shut up, you lucky stiff, I says. If you wasn't so damn lucky, you'd be sweeping the streets. Then I walks on out. I was too busy with the girl to see much of speed after that. He left home about the middle of the month to go to Tampa with the Cubs. I got notice from Indianapolis that I was sold to Baltimore. I didn't care much about going there, and I wasn't anxious to leave home under the circumstances, so I didn't report till late. When I read in the papers along in April that Speed had been traded to Boston for a couple of pitchers, I thought, gee, he must have lost his rabbit's foot. Because even if the Cubs didn't cop again, they'd have a city serious with the White Sox and get a bunch of dough that way. And they wasn't no chance in the world for the Boston club to get nothing but their salaries. It wasn't another month, though, till Schaefer of the Giants quit baseball and McGraw was up against it for a third baseman. Next thing I knowed, Speed was traded to New York and was with another winner, for they never was out of first place all season. I was getting along all right at Baltimore, and Dunny liked me, so I felt like I had something more than just a one-year job, something I could get married on. It was all framed that the wedding was coming off as soon as this season was over, so you can believe I was pulling for October to hurry up and come. One day in August, two months ago, Donnie come in the clubhouse and handed me the news. Rube Aldrin's busted his leg, he says, and he's out for the rest of the season. Connie's got a youngster named Joyce that he can stick in there, but he's got to have an extra outfielder. He's made me a good proposition for you, and I'm going to let you go. It'll be pretty soft for you, because they've got the pennant cinched, and they'll cut you in on the big money. Yes, I says, and when they're through with me, they'll ship me to hell and gone, and I'll be dragging down about seventy-five bucks a month next year. Nothing like that, says Dunny. If he don't want you next season, he's got to ask for waivers. And if you get out of the big league, you come right back here. That's all framed. So that's how I come to get with the athletics. Connie gave me a nice, comfortable seat in one corner of the bench, and I had the pleasure of watching a real ball club perform every afternoon and sometimes twice. Connie told me that as soon as they had the flag cinched, 
He was going to lay off some of his regulars, and I'd get a chance to play. Well, they cinched it the fourth day of September, and our next engagement was with Washington on Labor Day. We had two games, and I was in both of them. And I broke in with my usual lovely luck, because the pitchers I was asked to face was Bowling, a nasty left-hander, and this guy Johnson. The morning game was Bowling's, and he wasn't no worse than some of the rest of his kind. I only whiffed once, and would have had a triple if Milan hadn't run from here to New Orleans and stolen one off me. I'm not boasting about my first experience with Johnson, though. They can't never tell me he throws them balls with his arm. He's got a gun concealed about his person, and he shoots them up there. I was leading off in Murphy's place, and the game was a little delayed in starting, because I'd watched the big guy warm up and wasn't in no hurry to get to that plate. Before I left the bench, Connie says, Don't try to take no healthy swing. Just meet him and you'll get along better. So I tried to just meet the first one he throwed, but when I stuck out my bat, Henry was throwing the pill back to Johnson. Then I thought, maybe if I start swinging now at the second one, I'll hit the third one. So I let the second one come over, and the umps guessed it was another strike, though I'll bet a thousand bucks he couldn't see it no more than I could. While Johnson was still winding up the pitch again, I started to swing, and the big cuss crosses me with a slow one. I lunged at it twice and missed it both times, and the force of my wallop throwed me clean back to the bench. The athletics was all laughing at me, and I laughed too, because I was glad that much of it was over. McGinnis gets a base hit off him in the second inning, and I asked him how he done it. He's a friend of mine, says Jack, and he lets up when he pitches to me. I made up my mind right there that if I was going to be in the league next year, I'd go out and visit Johnson this winter and get acquainted. I wished before the day was over that I was hitting in the catcher's place because the fellas down near the tail end of the batting order only had to face him three times. He fanned me on three pitched balls again in the third, and when I come up in the sixth, he scared me to death by pretty near beaning me with the first one. Be careful, says Henry. He's getting pretty wild, and he's liable to knock you away from your uniform. Don't he never curve one, I asked? Oh, sure, says Henry. Do you want to see his curve? Yes, I says, knowing the hook couldn't be no worse than the fast one. So he give me three hooks in succession, and I missed them all. But I felt more comfortable than when I was ducking his fastball. In the ninth, he hit my bat with the curve, and the ball went on the ground to McBride. He booted it, but throwed me out easy because I was so surprised at not having whiffed that I forgot to run. Well, I went along like that for the rest of the season, running up against the best pitchers in the league and not exactly murdering them. Everything I tried went wrong, and I was smart enough to know that if anything had depended on the games, I wouldn't have been in there for two minutes. Joyce and Strunk and Murphy wasn't jealous of me a bit, but they was glad to take turns resting, and I didn't care how much I went so long as I was sure of a job next year. I'd wrote to the girl a couple of times, asking her to set the exact date for our wedding, but she hadn't paid no attention. She said she was glad I was with the athletics, but she thought the Giants were going to beat us. I might have suspected from that that something was wrong, because not even a girl would pick the Giants to trim that bunch of iron. Finally, the day before the series started, I sent her a kind of sassy letter saying I guessed it was up to me to name the day and asking whether October 20th was all right. I told her to wire me yes or no. I'd been reading the dope about Speed all season, and I'd known he'd had a whale of a year and that his luck was right with him, but I never dreamed a man could have the Lord on his side as strong as Speed did in that World Series. I might as well tell you all the dope, so long as you wasn't there. The first game was on our grounds, and Connie gave us a talking to in the clubhouse beforehand. 
The shorter the serious is, the better for us. If it's a long serious, we're going to have trouble, because McGraw's got five pitchers he can work, and we've got about three. So I want you boys to go at em from the jump and play em off their feet. Don't take things easy, because it ain't going to be no snap. Just because we've licked em before ain't no sign we'll do it this time. Danny calls me to one side and asks me what I know about Parker. You was with the Cubs when he was, wasn't you? He says. Yes, I says, and he's the luckiest stiff you ever seen. If he got stewed and fell in the gutter, he'd catch a fish. I don't like to hear a good ball player called Lucky, says Connie. He must have a lot of ability, or McGraw wouldn't use him regular. And he's been hitting about 340 and played a bang-up game at third base. That can't be all luck. Where do you see him, I says. And if you don't say he's the luckiest guy in the world, you can sell me to the Boston Bloomer girls. He's so lucky, I says, that if they traded him to the St. Louis Browns, they'd have the pennant cinched by the 4th of July. And I'll bet Connie was willing to agree with me before it was over. Well, the Chief worked against the Big Rube in that game. We beat him, but they gave us a battle, and it was Parker that made it close. We'd gone along nothing and nothing till the 7th, and then Rube walks Collins, and Baker lifts one over that little old wall. You'd think by this time them New York pitchers would know better than to give that guy anything he can hit. In their part of the ninth, the Chief still had him shut out, and two down, and the crowd was going home. But Doyle gets hit in a sleeve with a pitch ball, and it's Speed's turn. He hits a foul pretty near straight up, but Shang misjudges it. Then he lifts another one, and this time McInnes drops it. He ought to have been out twice. The Chief tries to make him hit at a bad one then, because he's got him two strikes and nothing. He hit at it all right, Kissed it for three bases between Strunk and Joyce. And it was a wild pitch that he hit. Doyle scores, of course, and the Bugs suddenly decide not to go home just yet. I fully expected it to see him steal home and get away with it, but Murray cut into the first ball and lined out to Barry. Plank beat Matty 2-1 to one the next day in New York, and again Speed and his rabbit's foot give us an awful argument. Matty wasn't so good as usual, and we really ought to have beat him bad. Two different times, Strunk was on second, waiting for any kind of wallop, and both times Barry cracked him down the third base line like a shot. Speed stopped the first one with his stomach and extricated the pill just in time to nail Barry at first base and retire the side. The next time, he throwed his glove in front of his face in self-defense, and the ball stuck in it. In the sixth inning, Chang was on third base and Plank on first, and two down, and Murphy combed an awful one to Speed's left. He didn't have time to stoop over, and he just stuck out his foot. The ball hit it, and caromed in two hops right into Doyle's hands on second base before Plank got there. Then in the seventh, Speed bunts one, and Baker trips and falls going after it, or he'd have thrown him out a mile. They was two gone. So Speed steals second, And, of course, Shang has to make a bad peg right at that time and let him go to third. Then Collins boots one on Murray, and they've got to run. But it didn't do them no good because Collins and Baker and McGinnis come up in the ninth and walloped them where Parker couldn't reach him. Coming back to Philly on the train that night, I says to Connie, What do you think of that Parker bird now? He's lucky, all right, says Connie, smiling. But we won't hold it against him if he don't beat us with it. It ain't too late, I says. He ain't pulled his real stuff yet. The whole bunch was talking about him and his luck and saying it was time for things to break against him. I warned them that there wasn't no chance that it was permanent with him. Bush and Tezro hooked up next day and neither of them had much stuff. Everybody was hitting and it looked like anybody's game right up to the ninth. Speed had got on every time he come up, the wind blowing his fly balls away from the outfielders, 
and the infielders booting when he hit him on the ground. When the ninth started, the score was seven apiece. Connie and McGraw both had their whole pigeon staffs warming up. The crowd was wild, because they'd been all kinds of action. There wasn't no danger of anybody's leaving their seats before this game was over. Well, Besher is walked to start with, and Connie's about ready to give Bush one hook. But Doyle pops out trying to bunt. Then Speed gets two strikes and two balls, and it looked to me like the next one was right over the heart. But Connolly calls it a ball and gives him another chance. He wails the groove ball to the fence in left center and gets round to third on it while Besher scores. Right then, Bush comes out and the Chief goes in. He whiffs Murray and has two strikes on Merkel when Speed makes a break for home. And, of course, that was the one ball Shang dropped in the whole series. They had a two-run lead on us, and it looked like a cinch for them to hold it, because the minute Tezro showed a sign of weakening, McGraw was sure to holler for Matty or the Rube. But you know how quick that bunch of iron can make a two-run lead look sick. Before McGraw could get Jeff out of there, we had two on the bases. Then Rube comes in and fills him up by walking Joyce. It was Eddie's turn to wallop, and if he didn't do nothing, we had Baker coming up next. This time, Collins saved Baker the trouble and wanged one clear to the woods. Everybody scored but him, and he could have too if it had been necessary. In the clubhouse, the boys naturally felt pretty good. We copped three in a row, and it looked like we'd make it four straight because we had the chief to send back at him the following day. Your friend Parker is lucky, the boy says to me, but it don't look like he could stop us now. I felt the same way and was consulting the timetables to see whether I could get a train out of New York for the West next evening. But do you think Speed's luck was ready to quit? Not yet. And it's a wonder we didn't all go nuts during the next few days. If words could kill, Speed would have died a thousand times, and I wish he had. There wasn't no record-breaking crowd out when we got to the polo grounds. I guess the New York bugs was pretty well discouraged, and the betting was 8-5 to five that we'd cop that battle and finish it. The chief was the only guy that warmed up for us, and McGraw didn't have no choice but to use Matty, with the whole thing depending on this game. They went along like the two swell pitchers they was till Speed's inning, which in this battle was the eighth. Nobody scored, and it didn't look like they was ever going to, till Murphy starts off that round with a perfect bunt, and Joyce sacrifices him to second. All Matty had to do then was get rid of Collins and Baker, and that's about as easy as selling silk socks to an Eskimo. He didn't give Eddie nothing he wanted to hit, though, and finally he slaps one on the ground to Doyle. Larry made the play to first base, and Murphy moved to third. We all figured Matty would walk Baker then, and he done it. Connie sends Baker down to second on the first pitch to McGinnis, but Myers don't pay no attention to him. They was playing for McGinnis and wasn't taking no chance on throwing the ball away. Well, the count goes to 3-2 and two on McGinnis, and Matty comes with a curve. He's got some curve, too, but Jack happened to meet it, and Bluey, down the left field line where he always hits. I never seen a ball hit so hard in my life. No infielder in the world could have stopped it, but I'll give you a thousand bucks if that ball didn't go kerplunk right into the third bag and stop as dead as George Washington. It was child's play for Speed to pick it up and heave it over to Merkel before Jack got there. If anybody else had been playing third base, the bag would have ducked out of the way of that wallop, but even the bases themselves was helping him out. The two runs we ought to have had on Jack Smash would have been just enough to beat him, because they got the only run of the game in their half, or I should say, the Lord give it to them. Doyle had been thrown out, and up come Parker, smiling. The minute I seen him smile, I felt like something was coming off. I made the remark on the bench. Well, Chief pitched one right at him, 
and he tried to duck. The ball hits his bat and went on a line between Jack and Eddie. Speed didn't know he'd hit it till the guys on the bench wised him up. Then he just had time to get the first base. They tried to hit and run on a second ball, and Murray lifts a high fly that Murphy didn't have to move for. Collins pulled the old bluff about the ball being on the ground, and Barry yells, Go on, go on, like he was the coacher. Speed fell for it and didn't know where the ball was no more than a rabbit. He just run his fool head off, and we was getting all ready to laugh when the ball come down and Murphy dropped it. If Parker had stuck near first base like he ought to have done, he couldn't have got no farther than second. But with the start he got, he was pretty near third when Murphy made the muff, and it was a cinch for him to score. The next two guys was easy outs, so they wouldn't have had a run except for Speed's boner. We couldn't do nothing in the ninth, and we was licked. Well, that was a tough one to lose, but we figured that Matty was through, and we'd wind it up the next day, as we had Plank ready to send back at him. We wasn't afraid of the Rube, because he had never bothered Collins and Baker much. The two left-handers come together just like everybody doped it, and it was about even up to the eighth. Plank had been going great, and though the score was two and two, they'd got their two on boots, and we'd hit Arn in. We went after Rube in our part of the eighth and knocked him out. Demery stopped us after we'd scored two more. It's all over but the shoutin', says Davis on the bench. Yes, I says, unless that seventh son of a seventh son gets up there again. He did. And he come up after they filled the bases with a boot, a base hit, and a walk with two out. I says to Davis, if I was Plank, I'd pass him and give him one run. That wouldn't be no baseball, says Davis. Not with Murray coming up. Well, it mayn't have been no baseball, but it couldn't have turned out worse if they did it that way. Speed took a healthy at the first ball, but it was a hook, and he caught it on the handle, right up near his hands. It started outside the first base line like a foul, and then changed its mind and rolled in. Shang ran away from the plate, because it looked like it was up to him to make the play. He picked the ball up and had to make the peg in a hurry. His throw hit speed right on top of the head and bounded off like it had struck a cement sidewalk. It went clear over to the seats, and before McGinnis could get it, three guys had scored and speed was on third base. He was left there, but that didn't make no difference. We was licked again, and for the first time, the gang really begun to get scared. We went over to New York Sunday afternoon, and we didn't do no singing on the way. Some of the fellers tried to laugh, but it hurt them. Connie sent us to bed early, but I don't believe none of the bunch got much sleep. I know I didn't. I was worrying too much about the serious, and also about the girl, who hadn't sent me no telegram like I'd asked her to. Monday morning, I wired her asking what was the matter, and telling her I was getting tired of her foolishness. Of course, I didn't make it so strong as that, but the telegram cost me a dollar and forty cents. Connie had the choice of two pitchers for the sixth game. He could use Bush, who'd been slammed around pretty hard last time out, or the Chief, who'd only had two days rest. The rest of them, outside of Plank, had an epidemic of sore arms. Connie finally picked Bush so's he could have the chief in reserve in case we had to play a seventh game. McGraw started Big Jeff, and we went at it. It wasn't like the last time these two guys had hooked up. This time they both had something, and for eight innings, runs was as scarce as Chinese policemen. They'd been chances to score on both sides, but the big guy and Bush was both tight in the pinches. The crowd was plumb nuts, and yelled like Indians every time a fly ball was caught or a strike called. They'd have got their money's worth if they hadn't been no ninth, but believe me, that was some round. They was one out when Barry hit one through the box for a base. Shang walked, and it was Bush's turn. Connie told him to bunt, but he whiffed in the attempt. Then Murray comes up and walks, and the bases are choked. 
Young Joyce had been pie for Tezro all day, or else McGraw might have changed pitchers right there. Anyway, he left Big Jeff in, and he beamed Joyce with a fast one. It sounded like a tire blowing out. Joyce falls over in a heap, and we chase out there thinking he's dead. But he ain't. And pretty soon, he gets up and walks down to first base. Tezro had forced in a run, and again we begun to count the winner's end. Matty comes in to prevent further damage, and Collins flies the side out. Told him now, work hard, we says to young Bush. And he walks out there just as cool as though he was going to hit fungos. McGraw sends up a pinch hitter for Matty, and Bush whiffed him. Then Besher flied out. I was praying that Doyle would end it, because Speed's turn come after hisn, so I pretty near fell dead when Larry hit safe. Speed had had his old smile, and even more chest than usual when he come up there, swinging five or six bats. He didn't wait for Doyle to try and steal or nothing. He lit into the first ball, though Bush was trying to waste it. I seen the ball go high in the air toward left field, and then I picked up my glove and got ready to beat it for the gate. But when I looked out to see if Joyce was set, what do you think I seen? He was lying flat on the ground. That blow on the head had got him just as Bush was pitching to speed. He'd flopped over and didn't no more know what was going on than if he'd croaked. Well, everybody else seen it at the same time, but it was too late. Strunk made a run for the ball, but there wasn't no chance for him to get near it. It hit the ground about ten feet back of where Joyce was lying and bounded way over to the end of the foul line. You don't have to be told that Doyle and Parker both scored and the series was tied up. We carried Joyce to the clubhouse and after a while he come to. He cried when he found out what had happened. We cheered him up all we could, but he was a pretty sick guy. The trainer said he'd be all right, though, for the final game. They tossed up a coin to see where they'd play the seventh battle, and our club won the toss. So we went back to Philly that night and cussed Parker clear across New Jersey. I was so sore I kicked the stuffing out of my seat. You probably heard about the excitement in the burg yesterday morning. The demand for tickets was something fierce, and some of them sold for as high as 25 bucks apiece. Our club hadn't been looking for no seventh game, and they was some tall hustling done round that old ballpark. I started out to the grounds early and bought some New York papers to read on the car. There was a big story that Speed Parker, the Giants hero, was going to be married a week after the end of the series. It didn't give the name of the girl, saying Speed had refused to tell it. I figured she must be some dame he met round the circuit somewheres. There was another story by one of them smart baseball reporters saying that Parker, on his way up to the plate, had saw that Joyce was about ready to faint and had hit the fly ball to left field on purpose. Can you beat it? I was going to show that to the boys in the clubhouse, but the minute I blowed in there, I got some news that made me forget about everything else. Joyce was very sick, and they took him to a hospital. It was up to me to play. Connie come over and asked me whether I'd ever hit against Matty. I told him I hadn't, but I'd saw enough of him to know he wasn't no worse than Johnson. He told me he was going to let me hit second in Joyce's place because he didn't want to bust up the rest of his combination. He also told me to take my orders from Strunk about where to play for the batters. Where shall I play for Parker, I says, trying to joke and pretend I wasn't scared to death. I wish I could tell you, says Connie. I guess the only thing to do when he comes up is to get down on your knees and pray. The rest of the bunch slapped me on the back and give me all the encouragement they could. The place was jammed when we went out on the field. They may have been bigger crowds before, but they never was packed together so tight. I doubt whether there was even room enough left for Falkenberg to sit down. The afternoon papers had printed the stuff about Joyce being out of it, so the bugs was wise that I was going to play. 
they watched me pretty close in batting practice and give me a hand whenever I managed to hit one hard. When I was out catching fungos, the guys in the bleachers cheered me and told me they was with me. But I don't mind telling you that I was nervous as a bride. There wasn't no need for the announcers to tip the crowd off to the pitchers. Everybody in the United States and Cuba knowed that the chief had worked for us and Maddie for them. The chief didn't have no trouble with them in the first inning. Even from where I stood, I could see that he had a lot of stuff. Besher and Doyle popped out, and Speed whiffed. Well, I started out making good with reverse English in our part. Fletcher booted Murphy's ground ball, and I was sent up to sacrifice. I'd done a complete job of it, sacrificing not only myself, but Murphy, with a pop fly that Maddie didn't have to move for. That spoiled whatever chance we had of getting the jump on him. But the boys didn't ball me for it. That's all right, old boy, you're all right, they said on the bench. If they'd had a gun, they'd have shot me. I didn't drop no fly balls in the first six innings, because none was hit out my way. The chief was so good that they wasn't hitting nothing out of the infield. And we wasn't doing nothing with Maddie either. I let off in the fourth and fouled the first one. I didn't molest the other two. But if Connie and the gang talked about me, they'd done it internally. I come up again with Murphy on third base and two gone in the sixth and done my little whiffing specialty. And still, the only people that panned me was the 30000 that had paid for the privilege. My first fielding chance come in the seventh. You'd have thought that I'd have had my nerve back by that time, but I was just as scared as though I'd never saw a crowd before. It was just as well that they was two out when Merkel hit one to me. I staggered under it, and finally it hit me on the shoulder. Merkel got the second, but the chief whiffed the next guy. I was gave some cross looks on the bench, and I shouldn't have blamed the fellers if they cut loose with some language. But they didn't. There's no use in me telling you about none of the rest of it, except what happened just before the start of the 11th and during that inning, which was sure the big one of yesterday's pastime, both for speed and yours sincerely. The scoreboard was still a row of ciphers, and speed had only a fair amount of luck. He made a scratch base hit, and robbed our bunch of a couple of real ones with impossible stops. When Shang flied out and wound up our tenth, I was leaning against the end of our bench. I heard my name spoke, and turned round and seen a boy at the door. Right here, I says, and he give me a telegram. Better not open it till after the game, says Connie. Oh, it ain't no bad news, I said for I figured it was an answer from the girl. So I opened it up and read it on the way to my position. It said, Forgive me, Dick, and forgive Speed, too. Letter follows. Well, sir, I ain't no baby, but for a minute I just wanted to sit down and bawl. And then all of a sudden I got so mad I couldn't see. I run right into Baker as he was picking up his glove. Then I give him a shove and called him some name, and him and Barry both looked at me like I was crazy, and I was. When I got out in left field, I stepped on my own foot and spiked it. I just had to hurt somebody. As I remember it, the chief fanned the first two of them. Then Doyle catches one just right and lambs it up against the fence back of Murphy. The ball caromed round some, and Doyle got all the way to third base. Next thing I seen was Speed strutting up to the plate. I run clear in from my position. Kill him, I says to the chief. Hit him in the head and kill him, and I'll go to jail for it. Are you off your nut, says the chief. Go out there and play ball and quit raving. Barry and Baker led me away and gave me a shove out toward left. Then I heard the crack of the bat, and I seen the ball coming a mile a minute. It was headed between Strunk and I, and looked like it would go out of the park. I don't remember running or nothing about it till I run into the concrete wall head first. 
They told me afterward, and all the papers said, that it was the greatest catch ever seen. And I never knowed I'd caught the ball. Some of the managers have said my head was pretty hard, but it wasn't as hard as that concrete. I was pretty near out, but they tell me I walked to the bench like I wasn't hurt at all. They also tell me that the crowd was a bunch of raving maniacs and was throwing money at me. I guess the groundskeeper will get it. The boys on the bench was all talking at once and slapping me on the back, but I didn't know what it was about. Somebody told me pretty soon that it was my turn to hit, and I picked up the first bat I come to and starts for the plate. McInnes comes running after me and asks me whether I didn't want my own bat. I cussed him and told him to mind his own business. I didn't know it at the time, but I found out afterward that they was two out. The bases was empty. I'll tell you just what I had in my mind. I wasn't thinking about the ball game. I was determined that I was going to get to third base and give that guy my spikes. If I didn't hit one worth three bases, or if I didn't hit one at all, I was going to run till I got round to where speed was and then slide into him and cut him to pieces. Right now, I can't tell you whether I hit a fastball or a slow ball or a hook or a fader, but I hit something. It went over Besher's head like a shot and then took a crazy bound. It must have struck a rock or a pop bottle because it hopped clear over the fence and landed in the bleachers. Mind you, I learned this afterwards. At the time, I just knowed I hit one somewheres and I starts round the bases. I speeded up when I got near third and took a run and jump at a guy I thought was Barker. I missed him and sprawled all over the bag. Then all of a sudden I come to my senses. All the athletics was out there to run home with me, and it was one of them I'd tried to cut. Speed had left the field. The boys picked me up and seen to it that I went on and touched the plate. Then I was carried into the clubhouse by the crazy bugs. Well, they had a celebration in there, and it was a long time before I got a chance to change my clothes. The boys made a big fuss over me. They told me they'd intended to give me 500 bucks for my divvy, but now I was going to get a full share. Barker ain't the only lucky guy, says one of them. But even if that ball hadn't have took that crazy hop, you'd have had a triple. A triple? That's just what I'd wanted, and he called me lucky for not getting it. The Giants was dressing in the other part of the clubhouse, and when I finally come out, there was Speed standing waiting for some of the others. He seen me coming, and he smiled. Hello, horseshoes, he says. He won't smile no more for a while. It'll hurt too much. And if any girl wants him, when she sees him now, with his nose over shaking hands with his ear, and his jaw a couple of feet foul, she's welcome to him. There won't be no contest. Grimes leaned over to ring for the waiter. Well, he said, what about it? You won't have to pay my fare, I told him. I'll buy a drink anyway, said he. You've been a good listener, and I had to get it off my chest. Maybe they'll have to postpone the wedding, I said. No, said Grimes. The wedding will take place the day after tomorrow, and I'll bat for Mr. Parker. Did you think I was going to let him get away with it? What about next year, I asked. I'm going back to the athletics, he said, and I'm going to hire somebody to call me horseshoes before every game because I can sure play that old baseball when I'm mad. End of Horseshoes by Ring Lardner Read by Rick Rodstrom